live from Nice, France, it's theCUBE, covering .next Conference 2017 Europe, brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman and this is SiliconANGLE Media's production of theCUBE. Happy to welcome back to the program CEO and founder of Nutanix, Dheeraj Pandey. The keynote this morning talking about how Nutanix uh, really going from uh, what had traditionally been an enterprise infrastructure company uh, really becoming uh, its goal of being an iconic software company. So Dheeraj, uh, you know, bring us up to speed as to you know, how Nutanix positions itself uh, for this future. Yeah, I think it's, and it's, uh, it's been a rite of passage because uh, you can start from you know, AWS on day one, you have to sell books and sell e-commerce, you know, you've been in the e-commerce space and it was a 20 year journey for them before they could get into computing and people took them seriously. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you know, little Apple with iPod and then iPhone and the iPad and then iTunes and App Store and all that stuff was a journey of 15 years, you know, before they could really say that they've arrived. I think for us, uh, we had to build the form factor of an iPhone first so that people realize what this hyperconvergence thing was before we could go and ship an Android as an operating system. Because if had an Android operating system come first, just like Windows uh, mobile operating system was around for a while and nobody really understood how to really go make money on it. I think we had to build a form factor first. And now that people grok it, we're like, now we can really go and make software out of this. And, distribute software and make the Android version of the iOS itself. And that's the thing, I think as a company we are challenged to balance these paradoxes. Like, oh, I thought you were an appliance company and you believe in this Apple-like finesse and polish and attention to detail. How do you apply that to an Android-like distribution model where you leave it to others to go and build handsets and so on? I think that's the challenge that we've taken upon ourselves. Now in Xi, with the cloud service, we'll have a lot of control. With appliances, we had somewhat control, you know, because we at least knew what a hardware it was running on. With software, we'd open it up. And opening it up, and yet not giving up on the attention or detail is the challenge that this company has to actually really go and undertake. We are looking at a lot of our tools that we have built for certifications and you know, passing the test, the litmus test for hardware, and, and we're trying to figure out how to automate the heck out of it, make them into cloud services, so that customers can now go and crowdsource certification. So there'll be some new paradigms that will emerge, and, and the reason why uh, we are well placed for those kind of things is because our heritage is appliance. Yeah. So now when we think of doing software, a lot of the tooling, a lot of the automation, the certifications, the attention to detail we had, we'll need to go and make them into cloud services. Uh, we have some of them, like uh, Sizer is a cloud service, X-Ray is a cloud service, Foundation is a cloud service. So a lot of these services will then go and make the job of certifying an unknown piece of hardware easier, actually. Yeah. I mean, in fact, even day two and beyond, we have uh, what we call NCC, which is a service that runs from within Prism to do health checks. You know, every two hours you can do health checks, so if there's a new piece of hardware that we thought we just certified, we need to keep uh, paranoid about it, stay paranoid about it to say, look, is the hardware really the hardware that we want it to be? Yeah. So there's lots of really innovative things we can do as a company that really had the heritage of appliance to go and do software as well. Yeah, absolutely. People always underestimate the interoperability required. Remember when server virtualization rolled out up, the BIOS you know, could, could make everything go horribly. Uh, even, you know, oh, containers could give you portability and run everywhere. Oh wait, networking and storage, there, there's considerations absolutely. there. Um, do you think it's getting to a point from a maturation in the market that the software, you know, you, you know can you in the future take uh, Nutanix to be a fully software company where you know, you, you, you kind of let somebody else take care of the, the, the hardware pieces and then you just become their software and then their service, software services. Uh, that that, that uh, seemed like a likely future? Yeah, I think uh, with the right tools, right level of automation, right, right level of machine learning, uh, right le level of talk back, you know, I say talk back, I mean uh, the fact that the heartbeats are coming to us, we understand what the customers are doing and with the right level of paranoia day two and beyond which is NCC, for example, is, we call it Nutanix Cluster Check. And it does like 350 odd health checks on a periodic basis. And it raises alerts and things like that. So 
with the right level of paranoia, I think we can really go and make this work. And by the way, that's where design comes in. Like, how do you think of X-ray as a service and foundation and, and uh, Sizer and NCC and so on? I think that's where the real design of a software company that is also not being callous about hardware comes in, actually. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think uh, it's not just about tech and products, it's also about go-to-market, you know, because the go-to-market has to change too. I mean, the kind of uh, packaging, the kind of pricing, the kind of ELAs, uh, sales compensation, channel programs, a lot of those things have to be revisited as well. So. I mean, there's upstream engineering you talked about, but there's a lot of downstream go-to-market engineering as well that needs to be done. For yeah, um, when, when it comes to, to go-to-market, partnerships are, are, are key. Of course, there's there's the channel, you want to grow your sales channel and grow piece, but for, also from a technology standpoint, uh, there's a comment I heard you make earlier this week, you know, Google uh, has the opportunity to be kind of that next partner as like Dell was a partner to give you uh, you know, pre-IPO credibility, Dell's, Dell's trusted you. Have Dell, you have Lenovo, you had IB up, up, up on stage there. Um, as a software company, who, who are the partners uh, that you know help Nutanix kind of through this next phase? I think you mentioned some of them already. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the cloud vendors will obviously open up. You know, and there'll be new ones that will open up over time as well, where we're thinking about ways to blur the lines between public and private, because I think you know, the world, and including the public cloud vendors, have come to realize that you, know, you can't have silos, you can't have a public cloud that's separate from the private and so on. So being able to blur the lines, there'll be a lot of cloud partners for us as well. I think on the hardware side, we already talked about uh, all of them actually. Now HP and Cisco are right now uh, partners in double quotes, because we go and make our software work on it. You know? right. But at some level, they'll probably also have to open up, and there's networking partners, they have been working with, uh, you know, Arista is a good uh, case in point, Plexi is another one, yep. uh, and security partners, like Palo Alto could be a very large one over time because we think about what firewalls need to be look like in the next five years and so on, you know. So, I think in every uh, way, uh, I look at even Apache Foundation, uh, which is not really a company, but the fact that we can really co-opt a lot of open source and build uh, calm marketplace apps, where the apps could be spun up in an on-prem environment, in a single tenant on-prem environment. And we can drag and drop them into a Xi multi-tenant environment. I think uh, being able to go and do more with Apache, to me it's the, I would say the biggest game changer for the company would be, what else can we do with Apache? Yeah. You know, because we did a lot in the first eight years, I mean obviously, Linux is a big piece of our overall sure. uh, story, you know, not just the hypervisor, but our controller and things like that is all Linux based, which grows the pace of innovation for this company actually. You know. But beyond Linux, we've used Cassandra and Zookeeper, and our RocksDB and things like that. Uh, what else can we do with Apache Spark and Kafka and uh, MariaDB and uh, things like that? I think we need to go and elevate the definition of infrastructure to include databases and no SQL systems and a batch processing Hadoop and things like that. All those things become uh, a part of the overall marketplace story for us. You know? That's where the real interesting stuff really yeah, comes the, from. How do you look at open source from a strategic standpoint from, 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 from Nutanix? Uh, I think it's been phenomenal because uh, we have then operated as a company that's bigger than we are. Because yeah. otherwise, I mean look at VMware, they don't have that goodness, nor does Microsoft actually. I mean, um, Amazon is the only one that really goes and makes the best out of open source. Explain that, we say, so Microsoft had a huge push into open source, uh, especially, you know, kind of publicly the last two or three years, but they've been working on it. They, you know, heavily embraced containers, you know, big on Kubernetes, uh, you know, yeah. you know I'm heavily. I'll give you examples. You know, I think there's a lot of architecture in what Microsoft is doing with open source. Like, of course, you know, Linux has to work on Hyper-V. So, that's a given. They cannot make a relevant stack without really making Linux work on Hyper-V. But they tried Hadoop on Windows, right. and Hortonworks actually even ported Hadoop on Windows, but there were not too many takers, actually. Right. You know? uh, containers will probably continue to make a lot of progress on Linux because of the LXC and LXD engines and things like that. And there's a lot more momentum on the Linux side of containers than there'll ever be on the yeah, Windows side and, of containers. And even well. Azure is running more Linux than they are Windows these days, so. Absolutely, now uh, that, that being said, 
Azure Stack is still Azure Stack. It's right. still Hyper-V, it's still System Center and Azure Center and things like that. Um, I think Microsoft will have to really redefine itself and change a lot of its thinking to really go and say we truly embrace open source like the way Amazon does, and like the way Facebook does, like the way Nutanix does, I think. You know, it's a very different way we look at open source, very much like Facebook and Amazon than, than someone else. I mean, VMware is, is way further away from open source in that sense. I mean, vSphere overall, you know, I mean, I would say that it probably is Linux based. ESX is Linux based from 17, 18 years ago. That, I'm sure that code path has been forked forever. And it's very hard for them to go and uptake from open source, from, uh, from the uh, overall upstream stuff, actually, that we've been able to do. I mean, our stuff runs on a palm-sized server. A palm-sized server, imagine, and that's what we put in a drone, and that's the uh, foundation of an edge cloud for us, in some sense, you know. Um, our stuff runs on an IBM power system, because IBM was doing a lot of work with open source KVM. Right. That made it easy for us to port it to HV and so on. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think HV has a lot more momentum, because it shares that overall code base with open source as well. And I think, uh, over time, we'll do many more things with open source, uh, including in the platform space, uh, the PaaS space, than ever before, actually. You know? Okay. Um, how's Nutanix doing globally? You know, what, 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 what more do you want to be doing? How, how, how would you rate yourself on kind of Nutanix as a global company? Mm. I think it's a great question, and, and uh, it's one of those that's a double-edged sword, actually, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So when you uh, stop growing, uh, non-US business becomes 50%, because right. that's pretty much the uh, reflection of IT spend. Half the spend is outside the US, half the spend is within the US. Uh, right now we are 65-35, which is a very healthy place to be in actually. You know? I don't want this thing to change to like 50-50 and because that's a proxy for, oh we stopped growing actually. You know? um, at the same time I'd love to be shipping everywhere because again as I said, the definition of enterprise cloud is even more relevant in you know, parts of the world that is not US actually. You know? uh, and uh, in that sense I think just being able to go in maintain that customer base uh, outside the US. I mean, uh, being able to do it in, I mean like, you know, we recently sold a system in Ma Myanmar, actually, and I was telling my friends that, look, now I can die in peace because we have a system in Myanmar and so on. You know? <laughs> but the very fact that they are partners and there's a channel community and there's technology champions and they're experts, they're certified people in these remote parts of the world, and the fact that we can support these customers successfully says a lot about the overall reach of the technology. The fact that it's reliable, the fact that it's easy to use and spin up, and the fact that it's easy to get certified on. I think it is the core of Nutanix, so I feel good about those things actually. All right. You, you've reached a certain maturity of product, uh, market adoption, and we, we've seen Nutanix starting to, starting to spread out into certain things, sometimes we call adjacencies. You talked about some of the different software pieces. How do you manage you know, the growth, the, the spread, uh, and make sure that you know, simplicity, we were talking to Sunil this morning about you know, you absolutely you want simplicity, but you also want to, you know, where, where does Nutanix play and where don't they play? Yeah. Uh, you know, great what, question, actually. Yeah. So, um, there's a really good book that I uh, was introduced to about two years ago. And it's also, there's some videos on YouTube about this book, it's called The Founder's Mentality. And uh, the YouTube video is called The Founder's Mentality as well. And it talks about this very phenomenon that as companies grow, uh, they become complex. And so they introduce a problem, it's called the paradox of growth. You know? The thing that you wanted to uh, really do was grow. And that thing that you covered kills you. Because growth creates complexity, and complexity is a silent killer of growth. So the thing that you coveted is the thing that kills you. And that's the paradox of growth actually, in very simple terms. And then it goes on to talk about what are the things they need to do because you start as an insurgent company and you, over time you start acting like you're, you're, uh, you've arrived and you're an in incumbent now all of a sudden. And the moment you start thinking like an incumbent, you're done in some sense. You know? So what are the headwinds and what are the tailwinds that you can actually produce to actually stay an insurgent? I think there's some great lessons there about 
an insurgent mindset and an owner's mentality and then finally uh, this uh, obsession for the front line. How do you think about customers as the first class thing? So um, I think that's kind of one of the guiding principles of the company. How can we continue to imbibe the founder's mentality in there as well? Where every employee can be a founder actually without really having the founder's tag and so on. And then internally, there's a lot of things we could do differently in the way we do engineering, the way we do collaboration. I mean, these are all good uh, things to revisit design. Not just the product design piece, but organizational design. Like, what does it mean to have two pizza teams and microservices and product managers and Prism developers and Calm developers assigned to two pizza teams and so on, QA developers and so on. So there's a lot of uh, structure that we can put at, at scale that continues to make us look small, continues to have accountability at a product manager level so that they act like GMs as opposed to as PMs. Yeah. Uh, where uh, each of these two pizza teams are like a quasi p &L. You know, they You can look at them uh, very objectively and you can fund them and if they start to become too big, you need to split them and if they're not doing too well, you need to go and kill them actually. All right, Dears, last question I have for you, enterprise cloud. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, when it first came out as a term, we said it was a little bit inspirational. What should we be looking at for the next year to really benchmark and show as, you know, proof points uh, that it's becoming reality, mm. uh, you know, from Nutanix? It's mm. a great point. Um, you know, obviously, um, when Gartner starts to use the term, very, a very close term, because they've used the term enterprise cloud operating system, and in one of the recent uh, discourses I saw enterprise cloud operating model. It's very similar to system versus model, but the operating model of the enterprise cloud is based on the tenets of you know, a web scale engineering. You know, the fact that things run on commodity servers and things that, uh, everything is pure software and uh, you have zero differentiation in hardware and all this differentiation comes in pure software, infrastructure is code. All those things were not going away. Now, how it becomes easy to use so that you don't need PhDs to manage it is where consumer-grade design comes in, you know, where you have this notion of prism and, and calm that actually come to really help make it easy to use. Uh, I think it's the core of enterprise cloud itself. You know, I think, uh, obviously, every layer in this uh, overall cake needs more features, more capabilities, and so on. But foundationally, it's about web scale engineering, consumer-grade design. And if you're doing these two things, getting more workloads, getting more geographies, getting more platforms, getting more features, all those things are, are basically a rite of passage. You, know, you need to continue to do them over time, actually. All right, well, well dear Raj, I had a customer on said the reason he bought Nutanix was for that fullness of vision. So, always appreciate catching up with you. Uh, and we'll be back with lots more coverage here from Nutanix.next here in Nice, France. I'm Stu Miniman, and you're watching theCUBE.